Hi, Coach Rory here. Our last video explored five of the best exercises for strengthening your hip muscles. Today we're diving deep into posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, commonly called posterior tibial tendonitis. I'll refer to it as PTTD for short. It's a relatively rare yet persistent injury that plagues some runners. We'll explore the anatomy of this tendon and tell you how to diagnose and treat PTTD. Sharp pains in your arch or foot. Visible inflammation along the tendon. Stiffness in your ankle joint. A popping sensation. You've been running through the pain lately, but now it feels as if you can barely lift your heel off the ground. If so, you're probably experiencing posterior tibial tendonitis. The posterior tibial tendon is a little known but hugely important anatomical structure along the inside of your ankle. The tendon itself is not much thicker than a pencil, but it plays an essential role in stabilizing your foot. The posterior tibial tendon inserts into your foot along your instep and runs up beside the medial malleolus. This large bump on the inside of your ankle attaches to the tibialis posterior muscle, which is buried deep inside your calves. By applying tension along the inside of your ankle, the tibialis posterior muscle and the posterior tibial tendon play a critical role in maintaining your arch and supporting your foot. Anytime you run or walk, your posterior tibial tendon locks your ankle in place, helping to hold your foot in a strong, rigid configuration when you push off the ground. It also functions to invert your foot, rolling your ankle to shift your weight to the outside of your foot. The hallmark sign of posterior tibial tendonitis is localized pain along the inside of your foot and ankle, sometimes stretching up a few inches onto your shin. There might be some mild swelling around the tendon, and the area might be tender or painful if you push on it. You may also experience pain when you try to activate your tendon by lifting the inside of your foot off the ground. But the best diagnostic test is the single leg heel raise. This test is also very helpful for ruling out other injuries that can cause pain in the same area. Stand on the affected foot with your knee locked straight and use your calf muscles to rise up all the way onto your forefoot locking your ankle into full plantar flexion at the top. Does this cause pain along the inside of your ankle or foot? Or more concerning, is it nearly impossible to lift your heel off the ground? If so, you probably have PTTD. This might seem confusing. Why would a calf exercise provoke pain along the posterior tibial tendon? The answer lies in the posterior tibial tendon's role as a stabilizer of the foot. Imagine that the arch of your foot is a suspension bridge. The posterior tibial tendon is the huge steel cable that provides the tension to support it. Without a strong, properly functioning posterior tibial tendon, your arch can't stay up, your ankle can't stay locked, and your calves can't leverage their strength across the joints in your foot. Like we mentioned earlier, this is a relatively rare injury. In fact, in one study, Posterior tibial tendon dysfunction ranks just 26th in a list of most common sports-related injuries. Besides general overuse or a tear sustained from, say, a bad fall, its causal factors are poorly understood. Some researchers, like Melissa Rabito and colleagues at the University of Calgary, have hypothesized that having a naturally high arch is protective against PTTD. But it is possible for runners of all arch heights to wind up with this injury. Among the general population, it is most common among overweight, middle-aged women, but this doesn't give any insight into runners. Even the role of gender is not clear. Now I hate to jump to the worst case scenario, but I will, but the condition can become so severe that your foot's arch collapses, leaving you with a permanently deformed foot. Yeah, you've heard of flat feet, but you probably don't wanna Google this. Doctors categorize PTTD into four stages. Stage one features tendon damage or inflammation, but no change in foot shape. In stage two, the tendon begins to become elongated and the arch gradually flattens. 
Once in this phase, you probably will not be able to perform a single leg heel raise at all. In stages three and four, the tendon may be partially or fully ruptured and there are permanent deformities in your foot and ankle. Because of the progressive nature of this injury, your first order of business should be to make sure you're not doing any permanent damage by seeking a podiatrist or foot and ankle orthopedist. You need to determine which stage you're in because once you reach stage two, specialized orthotic braces are recommended. If things progress to stage two and beyond, surgery is usually required. Fortunately, there are a number of scientific studies which have demonstrated that it is possible to successfully treat PTTD with conservative measures. From these, we have determined four key components which should underpin your recovery program. This is hard for most runners to hear, but time off your feet may be the best remedy. If you are trying to run through this injury, stop. stop. It's not worth risking permanent damage to your arch. This tendon is especially slow to heal, probably because the portion of the tendon which runs along your medial malleolus has poor blood supply. Therefore, you should take plenty of time off and try to cut back on other activities that aggravate your tendon. Cross-training activities like swimming, biking, and aqua jogging are okay as long as they don't cause pain. We've included a link with some tips regarding cross-training in the description below. Wear supportive shoes and orthotics all the time, even when you're just walking around the house. Speak with your doctor or podiatrist about whether you can use a rigid, over-the-counter orthotic or if a custom-made orthotic is preferred. For injuries like plantar fasciitis, over-the-counter orthotics like Superfeet or Power Step have been found to be just as useful as custom-made ones. In the case of PTTD, however, there's no research to support this. Although custom orthotics can be expensive and not all insurance companies may cover them, your doctor may recommend them to provide better support for your foot. Nearly every program for this injury employs a calf stretching regimen. A typical routine is 3 by 30 seconds of standing calf stretch against a wall, both with straight knee and bent knee done twice a day. You should stretch both sides and use an incline board if it's available to you. A 2009 study by Cornelia Kulig and her colleagues at the University of Southern California emphasizes that you should be wearing your shoes and orthotics while doing these stretches. A 2006 paper by Richard Alvarez and a team of doctors and physical therapists at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine lays out a comprehensive rehab program for stage one PTTD. The program contains two phases. In the first phase, rehab exercises address basic muscular endurance through a seated sole to sole exercise and three TheraBand exercises that should be performed once a day. The second phase of the Alvarez program, which begins three weeks after the first, incorporates single leg heel raises, toe walking, and balance board work. Perform these TheraBand exercises once daily, progressing to a stronger TheraBand when you can comfortably do all 200 repetitions without any breaks. As a reminder, unlike the subject of our video who is not hurt, be sure to wear your orthotics and shoes while doing these TheraBand exercises. For this exercise, begin by sitting in a butterfly position with the soles of your feet together. If it's more comfortable, you can do this exercise by sitting in a chair as well. Press the balls of your feet together and pull the toes up slightly towards the ceiling. You should feel the tibialis posterior tendon activate. Once you've done this, relax. Begin with four sets of 25 repetitions every day, building up to 12 sets of 25 by two weeks into the rehab program. Then combine sets until you're strong enough to do 300 repeats continuously without a break. Cross the unaffected leg over the affected one. Then secure the band around the ball of the affected foot. Use your other foot as a fulcrum. Hold the band with one hand and pull the foot inward against the resistance of the band. Return slowly and smoothly to neutral. Begin by securing the TheraBand around both feet. Allow your feet to start pointing inward. Then pull against the resistance of the band until your feet point upward. Make sure to move your ankles only, keeping your legs completely still. 
Attach the TheraBand to a secure object and then loop it around your forefoot. Without moving your leg, pull the TheraBand up towards your shin. While Alvarez and his team are proponents of higher reps with lower resistance, alternatively, Cornelia Kulig, who was mentioned earlier, and her findings call for more resistance. They recommend doing three sets of 15 repetitions of the inversion exercise at the highest tolerable resistance, twice daily. You can try both approaches to see which one suits you best. However, consulting a professional is your best bet. The single leg heel raise is exactly the same as the diagnostic test. Stand on one leg and slowly rise up as high as possible, putting your hands lightly against a wall or another object for balance if needed. Lower yourself down in a slow and controlled fashion. Start with only a few heel raises and progress over time until you can get up to 50 single leg heel raises. Toe walking is fairly simple. Walk forward with your ankles plantar flexed, keeping your heels high above the ground. You can start off with doing 8 to 10 yards and then slowly work your way up over time until you can toe walk for, say, 100 yards. Finally, Alvarez's program calls for balance board training with tapping in five different directions. While standing on the affected leg on a balance board, tap the board to the ground and return to a balanced position 20 times each for all five of the positions. Then repeat going the opposite direction. This will bring the total to two sets of 20 repetitions for each direction. For best results, plan on performing all exercises on a daily basis for at least three months. Icing, especially after doing your rehab exercises, is strongly recommended, both by runners and in the scientific literature. Foam rolling your calf muscles should help too, since loosening up your calves will reduce stress on your posterior tibial tendon. If these general exercises aren't helping, you might want to see a physical therapist who can identify whether you have any other strength or flexibility deficits that are contributing to your posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. If you still haven't improved after several months of conservative treatment, you should consult with a trusted podiatrist or orthopedist and discuss the possibility of surgery. There are dozens of different surgical techniques out there, so it definitely pays to see a doctor with a lot of experience. You should be very cautious when you decide to resume training. Start gradually with small amounts of easy jogging before trying to do a normal easy run, being sure to back off if you have any pain. A physical therapist with experience working with distance runners can help you develop an individualized program if needed. Have you ever experienced some of the symptoms described in today's video? Do you have high arches, low arches, or somewhere in between? Be honest, had you even heard of this injury prior to the video? Comment below with your thoughts or suggest a topic for some of our future videos. If you haven't done so by now, subscribe so you know when we drop our next video.